Hi there, my name's Ron Wright. I'm a law professor here at Wake Forest University School of Law. Uh, we're gonna be talking today about a criminal procedure doctrine uh, that's called the doctrine of probable cause. And we'll talk about the way that that's defined. Uh, in particular, we'll be looking at, a, a, at one historical moment back in 1949, a case called Brenegar versus United States. And we'll see what that case from the US Supreme Court tells us about how to define probable cause. Uh, and then we'll look at what happened after Brenegar and what state courts do today. So let's go inside and get started talking about probable cause. Okay, folks, let's get started. We're going to talk today about the probable cause standard. Now, probable cause is the legal standard that we use to tell the government how much information it has to have before they're allowed to uh, stop somebody and arrest them, to arrest them, uh, or second, to do a full-blown search of their home or their car or other place, a non-public place, or even to fully search their person. Not a, just a pat-down frisk, but a full search requires probable cause. Well, what does that mean? We're going to talk today about how you define probable cause. This whole fr framework's been with us for centuries, and I'm not going to go back through the mists of time and tell you all the different ways we've done this over the centuries, but I do want to focus on two different uh, sources of this probable cause definition today. The first is a case from the United States uh, Supreme Court uh, called Brenegar versus United States. It was uh, published in 1949 and it has become one of the key sources of language uh, that other courts use as they're trying to describe what we need for probable cause. Uh, and then the second uh, set of sources I'm going to look to are things that state court uh, judges say today in their appellate opinions as they're evaluating on an ongoing basis whether the police have a good enough reason to stop a, uh, a car and arrest a person uh, or whether they have enough uh, information, probable cause, to support a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, a full-blown search. Okay, um, let's talk first about Brenegar. Brenegar happened, the facts happened in 1947. It's out in the Plains. It's out in Missouri. It's Missouri and Oklahoma. And they've got laws about alcohol in Missouri and Oklahoma. And so in Missouri, it's okay to sell liquor. In Oklahoma, it's not okay to sell liquor. So we say Missouri is wet, Oklahoma is dry. Uh, there's a federal law that says you cannot import liquor into a state contrary to the laws of that state. So it is illegal to go across the line, buy liquor in Missouri, and then to import it into Oklahoma for sale over in Oklahoma where it's illegal to sell liquor. Uh, and so there are federal agents out enforcing this law, looking around for people who might be carrying liquor from one place to another. They see this guy, Virgil Brenegar. The federal agents who were watching are named Malsed and Crean. So Malsed and Crean see this guy, Virgil Brenegar. They say, wait a minute, I've seen that guy before. I arrested him five months ago for transporting liquor. And now that I think about it, I saw him a couple times in the last couple of months. He was in Missouri loading up his car full of liquor. Uh, I didn't get to follow him at that time, but boy, it looked like an awful lot of liquor. I didn't think he was gonna just drink that while he was in Missouri. So I think he might be buying liquor again and bringing it to Oklahoma. And as they pass him, on, they pass each other on the highway, they noticed when they look back, oh, you know what? He just speeded up. He just, uh, he just hit the road, hit the gas, and is trying to get away from us. And his car seems to be swaying a lot, like it's got a lot of extra, uh, a lot of extra weight in it. They can see him for quite a while because this is out in the middle of nowhere. We have a Google map. Uh, uh, map of the uh, roads involved here. So this is just, you know, quite open country between Joplin, Missouri and Venita, Oklahoma. So the agents turn around, they chase him down, they stop him. Ultimately, they find that he does have the liquor in the car. They arrest him. They bring charges for violation of this liquor sales law in the federal courts. And the, uh, the original court, the trial court, says, well, you know, I don't think they had enough information to stop Virgil Brenegar. But once they stopped him, uh, they did talk to him enough. And what they learned from him during that conversation ultimately gave them enough that we could call it probable cause. 
But there is a problem with the original stop. Now, this would be resolved differently today. This is old law back in 1947, and it turns out today we've clarified that you need something called reasonable suspicion to support the stop of a car, and that's something less than probable cause. But at the time, that wasn't so clear. So the judge was saying, at the moment of the stop, they didn't have probable cause. What you need probable cause for is an arrest or for a full-blown search. But at any rate, the question becomes, well, what is enough for probable cause? Did they have enough here? And the U.S. Supreme Court says, yes, they did. U.S. Supreme Court rules in this case that there's enough facts to support the agent's suspicion here so that it was appropriate for them to stop this driver whose car was kind of swaying on the, uh, on the road. The importance of Brenniger is not so much what happened to this one guy, Virgil Brenniger, but what the court says along the way about, uh, about how to define probable cause. And they say several different interesting things here. First of all, they say that we are dealing here not with certainties but with probabilities, and they're not technical. These are the kinds of facts that ordinary, non-legally trained people might use in their everyday life to make their decisions. So we're not looking for definitions in law books or in statutes. We're looking for the kinds of facts that convince people in ordinary life to make decisions and predictions about what's you know, likely going on and what's about to happen. How strong does that information be? Well, the court says in a famous phrase, they've got to be facts and circumstances within the officer's knowledge of which they had, quote, reasonably trustworthy information and it's got to be, and these facts have to be sufficient in themselves to warrant a man of reasonable caution. Today we would say a person of reasonable caution, but they said it would warrant a man of reasonable caution in the belief that an offense has been or is being committed. So that's the famous phrase from uh, Brinegar versus United States. The court also makes an interesting comparison here and says we're not going to put a probability number on it. We're, gonna, we're not going to say it's got to be. 30% likely or 50 or 70, but what they do say is that it's something less than the beyond a reasonable doubt standard that we use at trial, which is way up there, you know, close to certainty. Maybe, I don't know, 95% certainty. Something less than that can be probable cause. And it's got to be something more than a mere suspicion. Today we would say more than reasonable suspicion. So, you know, if you had to guess, it might be somewhere between, I don't know, 30, maybe 55% likelihood. People debate how much, what we're talking about here, but it's some kind of, of uh, level of certainty that's more than reasonable suspicion, but less than beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, a lot of the, uh, of the opinion in the Brinegar case is devoted to comparing this case to an earlier case called Carroll versus United States. It was decided in 1925. Uh, so while we have Justice Wiley Blunt Rutledge, uh, who's on the left of the screen here, deciding our uh, Brinegar case, we had Chief Justice William Howard Taft, also a former president, the only person ever to be president and then later a, ju a justice on the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. But uh, Chief Justice Taft decided the Carroll case. Pretty similar facts a car traveling during prohibition between Michigan and Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm sorry, between Detroit, Michigan and Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, and the agents noticed the car and thought it was suspicious, probably was running liquor. And so they stopped him. And the question was, did you have uh, probable cause to support the ultimate uh, arrest? Uh, and the court in Carroll also held that there was sufficient uh, fact to, uh, to support the standard of probable cause in, uh, in Carroll. So the Brenegar court goes through and compares fact by fact and says, well, you know, our case looks an awful lot like the, uh, like the Carroll case. In both cases, we were pretty sure that the car we saw belonged to a person, a particular person. We know that we know something about the identity of the car. The license plate was known in both cases. They knew some past involvement in illegal liquor operations by both of the defendants, both Brenegar and in the earlier case, Carroll. Uh, and they knew something about the road, that this was a road that was frequently used by people who were running liquor from one place to another, uh, violating the rules of the day. Uh, and so on all these grounds, the court said, our case is an awful lot like Carroll. We have to decide it the same way, what we call in, uh, among lawyers, stare decisis, or this thing has already been settled. Uh, want to flag this one thing for you, that is probable cause is often 
defined this way, by what we call the common law method. That is, it's not written down in legislative language, in a statute. It's not the legislature who declares this. Normally, it's courts who are interpreting a constitutional provision, like the Fourth Amendment guarantee against unreasonable searches and seizures. And in that setting, courts are the ones who lay out for us the general definition of probable cause, and they also talk about the particular facts that are enough. And then future courts look back to those earlier declarations, both the general terms of the declaration, but they also look back to the facts of those earlier cases and say, do our facts look like the old facts? So that's the method that we generally have in probable cause, um, in probable cause determinations. What could the officers have done differently in Brinegar? That's often a question when you're defining probable cause. Could the officers have done anything differently? Could they have turned their car around and followed at a greater distance and just watched Brinegar and see whether he get, gets home and whether he indeed pulls liquor out of his trunk uh, as they suspected he might? Do they then have to wait around to see whether he's trying to sell the liquor since uh, importation for sale is really what they're interested in, not so much uh, importation for personal use. That's often a question on the mind of the courts. That is, what else could the officers have done? Was there something pretty easy they could have done to get more information? And if there was, the court's more likely to say no probable cause here. But in this case, the court decided it would have been hard for them to get any more information than what they had. How does this standard get applied today? Normally, it's state Supreme Courts that are uh, asked to define probable cause. Somebody's been arrested, and the court is asked to exclude that evidence because they say the police officers committed an unreasonable search and seizure. It was not based on probable cause. They didn't have enough reason. Uh, and so the court has to decide, well, what is probable cause, and did they have enough here? Uh, along the way, they describe probable cause in terms very much like Brinegar, they often quote Brinegar and use the language we've already talked about as their starting point. So we get standard formulations like this. I'll read from a standard kind of mainstream definition, this one from South Dakota. The court says we need facts and circumstances such that a reasonably prudent person would conclude that an offense has been or is being committed. And if it's a search for property, we'd, you'd also say, and the property exists at the place designated. And you, have to decide, and you have to make that determination, quote, to a probability. So you've got to have some significant, substantial probability that a crime has been or is being committed, and therefore we can justify an arrest or a search for evidence of that, uh, of that crime. That's the kind of formulation that you often see. That's kind of the standard, the mainstream definition. There are some variations on that theme. So there are some states that emphasize that the person evaluating the claim is a magistrate, a judicial officer, somebody who sees a lot of these cases and can bring some expertise to the case and might see some significance in some small facts that others might not see. Other states will emphasize that the person making the presentation is an expert police officer, somebody who has learned over time the meaning of small cues in conduct and therefore uh, we can put some extra weight in the fact that the police officers found it to be suspicious. So we'll see that kind of discussion of police expertise in a number of these cases. Uh, and then finally there's one really interesting uh, example, kind of an outlier example. In Oregon there's actually a statute that tries to define probable cause. Normally, and it's uh, section 131.005 subpart 11, uh, in Oregon, the legislature says that probable cause happens uh, if, if it's more likely than not that on these facts we have a crime happening. That's interesting because that suggests it needs to be a 51% likelihood, more, a more, you know, a preponderance of the evidence standard. Normally, the implication is that it's something less than that that you need for probable cause. But what's interesting about the Oregon example is not only the standard used, 51%, but also where it comes from. It comes from the legislature rather than a court, and that's really unusual. Normally, this is judge law. This is this is law defined and applied by, uh, by judges. Um, one last thing about probable cause. This language that we've been, been talking about is pretty squishy. You can imagine it being applied differently in different places and in different factual contexts. But what's really interesting is if you go to a local courthouse 
and you start walking around and talking to people about probable cause and ask them, what does it mean? And here are some facts. Do we have probable cause here? You'll get remarkable agreement. In most places, there is real consensus, consensus among the lawyers, the judges, the other legal professionals at work there about what it means to have probable cause. It might differ a little bit from place to place, but there's a lot of continuity across different places when it comes to probable cause. And there's a lot of local agreement am among lawyers about what amounts to probable cause, what it means. So this language is a starting point, but it's an interesting example of local culture using that starting point language, developing it over time in a common law fashion so that everybody kind of gets a pretty concrete idea of what it means to have probable cause. When we get together next time, we're going to practice with these formulations. Uh, we're going to note how they play out in different factual settings, some common factual settings in criminal cases. And then we're going to move into the specialized context of what happens when probable cause is based on a tip that the police receive from an anonymous informant or a confidential informant. So that will be our topic uh, for next time, but we'll see you then.